So then I welcome our first uh, speaker, um, also very well known because she's the person translating um, Mickey's philosophy of imagination. So yeah, Professor Kramer, you have the floor. Thank you a lot. You, you can decide if you want to talk just like that or with the mic. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do I need a mic? Or? You, you, if, if, if the people in the back you can, can hear me, right? Yeah. Uh, th thank you. I want to thank uh, Fernando Birds and uh, Stephen Moss for inviting me. And thank you uh, for having this uh, conference. I think it's a very good idea. <clears throat> so uh, I'm basically going to read my paper. Uh, the title, as, as you can see, is Imagination and Technology in Miki Kyoshi, Ontological Formation of or as uh, Being in the World. In the late 1930s, Miki Kiyoshi began developing his system of the imagination or kosoryoku in the logic of imagination. Around the same time, he also developed his understanding of technology in his uh, philosophy of technology. So kosoryoku no rondi for uh, logic of imagination and philosophy of technology is Gijitsu Tetsugaku. Representative of his final years, uh, the former text takes up his work on technology, Gijitsu, to grasp its productive activity as the creation of forms by means of the imagination. Thus, characterizing what he calls the logic of imagination as also a logic of production, Seisaku no Rongi. The first half of a logic of imagination was initially serialized in the journal Shiso, or Thought, 1937 to 38, under the themes of myth institution and technology, which were then brought together and published in book form as Logic of Imagination Part 1 in 1939. Mickey began writing the next part on experience, uh, dealing with the philosophical history of the concept of imagination in relation to experience. And this was also serialized in the journal and then published posthumously after the war as Part 2 in 1946. Through this work, we find the imagination for Miki playing an ontological role in constructing our world, together with what in Heideggerian terms is our being in the world. The imagination expresses itself in embodied action, technologically constitutive of the concrete world, uh, producing what he calls forms. Uh, these are literally, uh, uh, there is a, a Parallel here uh, with um, uh, Bernard Stiegler, who more recently likewise has argued the imagination along with memory to be pr profoundly technological. And in this is shaping our world himself. So occasionally I'm going to make uh, comparisons with Stiegler. The imagination's ontological function for Mickey involves the social collective beyond individual subjectivity and extends into the unfathomable pre-conscious depths of life or seme in terms of nature beyond mere humanity. He takes off from Kant's understanding of the imagination as productive, but while Kant confined this to the epistemological and the aesthetic spheres, Mickey broadens it with ontological implications together with the role of technology in constructing the world. In the following, I will elaborate on Mickey's ontology of the productive imagination, especially in relation to the important role played by technology and in connection to the historical unfolding of this world. I will then close with the critical assessment of his concepts of imagination and technology. So the first section is uh, the ontology of the imagination as the a priori root of the faculties. Mickey's understanding of imagination takes off for the most part from German philosophy, especially Immanuel Kant. The German Einbildung indicates that it is a faculty of formation or cultivation, Bildung. Built means not simply image, but also form. This might explain Mickey's usage of the term Kesel, literally form image for the German built. 
taking off from Kant's understanding of the productive imagination and Heidegger's ontologization of it, we find Nietzsche broadening the imagination's formation of forms beyond the purely mental or ideal realm to the concrete somatic, social, and historical dimensions of the world in which technology plays a primary role. Like Heidegger, Nietzsche recognized the ontological significance of the synthetic function of imagination in Kant's critique the Reinen Femnun, critique of pure reason, that brings together sensibility and understanding on the basis of their originary common root. The originary root of the faculties that Kant himself Kant hinted at indicates for Mickey an ontological a priori deeper than and preceding the unity of apperception, a depth reaching into the historical world and its ongoing self-constitution of which we are embodied participants. Through this act of synthesizing opposing qualities, which Mickey characterized in terms of pathos and logos, the imagination produces form images, Keso. Mickey understood this synthesis to result in the concrete formation of the world with the production of institutions and involving technical or technological production. Poesis, for Mickey, is thus world forming, including the formation of meanings. Mickey asserts that without the relation of meaning to the imagination, we would be unable to conceive the word. Zin, the German Zin, sense or meaning. And even what Kant called common sense, uh, Gemeinsinn, and uh, sensus communis would thus be unthinkable. Meanings as such, as historical form images, are constitutive of the world. The imagination's formation thus has both semantic and ontological significance, unfolding through human interactivity and history, having practical and historical dimensions. Inheriting Heidegger's basic premise in his Kant reading, Mickey focuses on and develops Kant's suggestion that the imagination is the common but to us unknown root, from which springs sensibility and understanding, enabling their subsequent synthesis for cognition. Mickey expands the significance of that synthesis in terms of the dialectical unity of pathos, emotion, passion, or impulse on the one hand, and logos, the intellectual element. He inherits Kant's notion of the schematism, the imagination's a priori production of schemata or zushki, which are rules indicative of the scope or range for the production of such form images. And he finds in Kant's notion of the imagination's synthetic function a clue to how the rational and the irrational, the intellectual and the emotional, can be brought together to make the subsumption of the sensible manifold of phenomena under conceptual categories of the understanding possible. But Miki broadens and deepens Kantian imagination beyond its epistemic and even aesthetic roles to a more general social and historical world constitutive role. Miki's rendering of built as form image thus indicates the concretizing and somaticizing of the imagination's formations with an eye to the literal meanings of the Greek idos and morphe in addition to the German built. The concrete instances of such productive action, which Miki explicates in terms of myth, institution, and technology, constitute the first three chapters comprising the first part of the logic of imagination. In the fourth chapter or part two of the book, Miki dives into the work of Kant that he believes to have exerted the deepest influence upon post-Kantian German philosophy, Kant's uh, Critique der Urteilskraft, Critique of Judgment. Miki states that if we interpret the transcendental deduction in the first critique as the logic of imagination, we can interpret the third critique from the standpoint of the logic of imagination as well. And if the schematism operates in cognition, it also operates in aesthetics. Imagination within the third critique is productive without or prior to conceptual determination. And here the schematism, schematizing without concepts, appears to function under the guise of the aesthetic function of the example or model, an exemplary validity, connecting the imagination to the social, and what Kant called common sense, Gemeinsinn, 
or census communis. What is produced here is the result of genius attributed to the productive imagination, the ability to create unseen new forms and reorder reality in works of art. In his Anthropology in Pragmatischer Hinsicht, or Anthropology from a Pragmatic Point of View, Kant proposed the essential characteristic of genius to be originality. And in the third critique, he describes that originality as the talent for producing that for which no definite rule can be given. It is not some skill that can be learned or taught according to some rule and is thus opposite to the spirit of imitation. Mickey reiterates this point that its originality is its non-imitative productivity. Mickey explains that the aesthetic ideas it expresses are intuitions, representations of the imagination, but with no definite thought, i.e. concept adequate to it, hence linguistically inexpressible. Exceeding the bounds of conceptuality, the aesthetic work of genius cannot be fully communicated in language and induces in its audience an experience that likewise exceeds linguistic or conceptual boundaries. Judgment in responding to that product of genius, however, discovers within its singularity something general, but without recourse to an a priori conceptual rule. In demanding universal communicability, assuming universal approval that others ought to feel the same when presented with the same, judgment presents it as a prototype or archetype, urtitus, an example, vice field of a universal rule, even if that rule cannot be formulated. Mickey following Kant calls this exemplary necessity and interprets it to be the schema that genius provides for judgment. But in the reverse direction, judgment discovering that necessity in genius disciplines genius that otherwise can be lawless to give it order, or by taste makes its ideas communicable, agreeable, and capable of being followed by others. Genius is thus legitimized when its product is recognized by taste as exemplary. In simpler terms, genius invents and taste institutes, both being the imagination's formation, building, which assumes a communal, social, even if creative spirit. If the imagination is what is responsible for genius and taste in Kant's third critique, we may conclude that it has two opposing aspects. Creativity that is singular, escaping subsumption under a universal on the one hand, and exemplary necessity or common sense that is universal, even if paradigmatic, assuming assumed in judgment. Ontologically, this duplicity roughly seems to coincide with the two aspects Miki finds in the imagination synthesis as patos and logos. The subjective universality grasped as common sense, Gemeinsen, implies the spontaneous community, Gemeinschaft, of feelings, practices, mores, a sense that is common, Gemein. Common sense as such is the subjective principle determining the judgment of taste. Mickey suggests that this faculty of judgment that arranges in relation to concepts and uh, intuitions corresponding to them may itself be the faculty of imagination. On the above basis, Mickey claims that the logic of imagination in its intimate connection with judgment already evident in the first critique is deepened in the third critique through its discussion of non-cognitive or aesthetic judgment. We can add here that this connection between the productive imagination in genius and the reflective judgment of taste and common sense for Mickey ontologically shapes our world and thus our collective being in the world. Moreover, this social world is historical. For Mickey, it is not laws, but rather examples in the sense of historical schemes, schemas that are ontologically significant for the living historical human being who is historically created. 
What Miki unfolds from Kant's analysis is this concrete historical element, which is related to our embodied social nature. History unfolds via the actions of free individuals creating new forms. The irrational element of pathos alone do not suffice, however, in the creation of forms. They require the rational use of the intelligible and causal laws of nature. In our subjectivity, we are conscious of ends, teloi, which we intentionally pursue, and yet in our objectivity, we have a body in the physical world moved and conditioned among other bodies and objects. And so Miki emphasized in his contemporaneous work of 1941, Philosophy of Technology, that both subjectivity and objectivity, that's Shikang and uh, Kakkan, consciousness and the pre-conscious together constitute our embodied subjectivity, Shitai which in turn must actively negotiate with the physical world. The synthesis of these opposites in the imagination unfolds dialectically through history. The imagination breaks together, kakiatsmeru, the formless, to give it form, imposing logos on pathos. And this process unfolds through history as the transformation of forms. And then, so we get to the second section, Second section is titled uh, Imagination as the Historical Transformation of Forms. Imagination in Miki's reading expresses the human impulse to act through inventing, constructing, and altering the forms of reality. Working upon objects, transforming them, and giving them new form. Miki des designates this transformation of forms rooted in the imagination as the logic of forms, katachi no rondi. The logic of imagination as a logic of historical forms is also a logic of historical creation, like state kozo no rondi, and a logic of praxis involving our embodied interaction with the environment, a technological productive praxis. The images the imagination produces are formed images, Form images, case of images embodied in forms, so that it's logic that is a logic of production in the creation of new forms is a logic of form images. Objects are worked upon, transformed, and given new forms, so that the forms thus produced are not merely ideal but include physical forms. What the imagination gives birth to is thus not imaginary in the sense of fanciful fictions, but the very reality of the world. Moreover, they are historical, the forms unfolding reality through history. Human history involves the transformation of forms and the logical forms rooted in the imagination. On the above basis, uh, on, on the basis of the imagination's ongoing formations of the world, our experience is an occurrence in the world involving our active negotiation with the environment that in turn shapes our experience. It is this active negotiation between the embodied subject and environment where, whereby we encounter things and form them and in turn form ourselves, forming the things we encounter while being formed by them. As Miki develops his concept of imagination through the chapters on myth, institution, and technology, the embodied practical and concrete character of the forms of the imagination are apparent. Through them, human beings form history and in turn are formed. Myth, institution, and technology are the media of such forms, each as a dialectical unity of logos and pathos and all undergoing historical changes through human activities. In ancient Greek terms, muthos, nomos, and techne are thus all involved in the world's poesis. Imagination forms historical facts as we know them, as well as traditions transmitted from the past. Miki cites Jorges Sorel that through myth, people create the future and history. Myth thus has the na nature of historical creation. Myth is rooted in the sense of participation or symbiosis between the individual person and the social group to which he or she belongs and between that social group and its environment. 
when that participation loses its immediacy to no longer be felt or lived, myths become abundant to reassure one of the sense of participation or symbiosis. But while Sorel viewed myth as an expression of the will, Mickey sees the imagination to be operative at the root of the will itself. Following myth, Miki discusses institution as likewise forms produced by the imagination. While institutions have in common, what institutions have in common is that one, they possess a fictional character and that they are inventions that become conventions, thus having a social character that assembles a group of people uh, instead of being based on instinct. Two, they are endowed with the character of being customary or traditions whereby their fictionality is forgotten and they are seen as natural or ne necessary, as second nature. And three, they have the character of nomos or normativity in that they become coercive or constraining and authoritative vis-a-vis -vis the individual. What at first was invented by one or few individuals becomes copied or imitated and repeated by others to become custom, which in turn becomes tradition by being inherited by later generations to possess an imperative or normative character. Through custom and convention, the fiction of the institution becomes real and authoritative for the collective and operates as a powerful myth. The resulting world of culture is an artifice, albeit intersubjective, created by the imagination, possessing neither necessity nor secure ground in the realm of nature. And yet it possesses reality despite being fiction. These social, economic, and political institutions, as well as our moral or religious actions or behavior, are all forms making up the cultural environment. The normativity of these institutions constitutes their reality in shaping the world we live in. And as an institution or collection of institutions, culture is itself a form or the whole of forms. Mickey provides the example of ritual blood mixing to create artificial blood relations in ancient periods when blood relations were morally and socially necessary. A more current example would be greeting customs. As such institutions provide an objective expression to what otherwise is the subjective expression of the imagination. Institution as such includes, language, he says, language, custom, or manners, morality, law, politics, art, etc., and signifies culture as a whole. Even myth is a kind of institution. So the three modes of form that he dedicates the first three chapters to are thus not necessarily mutually exclusive, but can overlap in meaning. Institutions as systems of customary action emerge in the interactivity of human beings with their environment. He says institutions are fundamentally the adaptation of human conduct towards the environment. Unquote. Adaptations that in turn form our environment. Involving the habituation or customization of non instinctive acts, institutions emerge in the human being's active relationship with the environment as adaptations. And once institutions as such are set up and become operative in adapting to the environment, they in turn constitute a new environment for us. But as working adaptations, they are not fixed, but variable to constitute a historically formed social cultural environment. The concept of technology, Gijutsu, proves here to be significant. The primary role through which we trans transcend the environment in the attempt to adapt to it and to alter or transform it to form a new one occurs through technological productive action, encompassing not just industrial technology, but also social, conceptual, and psychological techniques to mediate, mediate our subjectivity with the environment transforming nature into culture, giving birth to our world. So technology, the productive act activity of the imagination that gives birth to new forms by structurally assimilating existing elements and new syntheses, new forms is the third mode or medium of forms. Everything made by technology has form and technological or technical activity itself is furnished with form. 
In Mickey's account, technology is the skill used to mediate the human embodied subject and the environment when there is estrangement between them and to create a new environment that can bridge over that estrangement. When the environment is alienating, human beings must either adapt to it or remake it through technological production into something compatible that is a human environment or culture. While animals go on living within the same order as their environing world, men, uh, human beings transcend uh, their environment from which they are estranged to construct it through technological production to better suit them. Miki explains in his philosophy of technology that technology is invention, which in turn essentially is formation or creation, kese or sozo. Its productive action taking uh, invention as its basis creatively adapts the subject to the environment, mediating their interactions and thereby producing a new environment with new forms, such as with institutions. More specifically, technology produces new forms by synthesizing two moments, the cognition of laws of nature, the objective, and the postulation of goals, the subjective. Another example of the imagination synthesis of the objective and the subjective, or logos and pathos. Resulting from uh, that synthesis is the third moment, the creation of newly defined forms through the actual alteration of things. The subjective expression of the imagination is thus given objective expression by institutions and made practical by technology. In this way, we overcome our alienation from the natural environment, adapting to it while also adapting it to our needs, reshaping it by establishing institutions, social and legal, to set up our social cultural environment. But as the world is transformed, human, the being of human beings are also transformed. Uh, quote, uh, by means of technology, human beings make the form, forms of themselves, society and culture, and goes on making new forms by changing those forms, unquote. Perhaps the implications are more drastic today than Mickey had foreseen. We might recognize, for example, to what extent information technology and cybernetics in contemporary society, for example, the social media or Elon Musk's proposed neural link is transforming our being in the world. As techno culture, they constitute a milieu of spiritual or intellectual production and information communication, wherein the subject is no longer a mere tool user, but as informed is in place, takes place within it. Mickey relates the imagination's productive activity and technology to what Kant called technological judgment in his third critique. Uh, sorry, teleological judgment in his third critique. For Kant, teleological judgment is the subject's discernment of the categories of understanding of objects and nature is determined according to lawful necessity, as if order, ordered for some purpose. In contrast to the first critique's determinate judgment that mediates understanding and sensibility for cognition, Kant in the third critique calls this teleological judgment reflective judgment. It assumes a purposiveness that orders nature as a whole. While understanding teleology in the third critique, uh, thus to uh, be indicative of a goal intending activity, Nikki takes it, however, to also have an objective sense as ontologically determinative. Teleology is formative and technological involving the somatic use of tools in a way that can alter the environment and unfold history. Technology synthesizes the cognition of the laws of nature with the configuration of human ends, the objective and the subjective, through the imagination, shaping them together into concrete form. Thereby, human beings act and create things, making history. On this basis as well, the logic of imagination is a logic of creation and a logic of history, hence a logic of historical creation a concrete logic of action participating in history distinct from mere abstract formal logic. And yet the will to create in itself underlying history is ateleological, purposeless. 
the logic of imagination at the root of the ateleological will in this way operates in the unfolding of history, but without any ultimate a priori idea guiding it. Uh, he says that the world of history is established at the root by the logic of imagination. Mickey thus asserts that history is made not in accordance with reason, but in accordance with imagination, creating ex nihilo, whereby its ends or purposes have the aspect of the purposeless in Kant's words, a teleology without telos, teleology on a telos. History itself is this alteration of forms without any preconceivable telos. Uh, he says the alteration of forms, that is transformation, metamorphose, katach no henka, or tenke, is the fundamental concept of history. History is inconceivable without forms being generated, developing, and vanishing, unquote. And in the philosophy of technology, Miki states, trans, quote, transformation is the fundamental operation of technology. This is also the fundamental concept of history as well, unquote. But what is astonishing is that in both uh, philosophy of technology and logic of imagination, Miki goes on to claim that this happens in nature itself as well. Uh, quote, the history of nature is the history of the transformation of forms, unquote. Both nature and culture are rooted in the transformations of the historic world based on technology. Quote, the technology of nature and the technology of man are both nothing but elements or stages of the self-formation of the historical world, unquote. Yet, since human beings act uh, of their own free will to make the world anew, there seems to be a dialectical tension of continuity and discontinuity between nature and man, determinacy and freedom. Human beings transcend the order of nature as free subjects working upon their environment. While from a narrower perspective of discontinuity, technology is thus peculiar to humanity and the imagination as a human faculty, from a broader perspective of continuity, there is technology of nature, whereby, quote, the creative logic of imagination is already at work within nature to the extent that we can view natural life as technological and making forms that follows the logic of imagination, unquote. By nature, shizen, miki means specifically biological nature. In that case, there appears to be for miki a kind of vague continuity extending from human consciousness to the unconscious and into the pre-conscious realm of life as such. So we get to the third, third section, which is uh, the historical world as the unity of natural history and human history. Mickey contends, as we saw just now, that this alteration of forms occurs not only in human history, but in nature as well. Quote, the history of nature is the history of the transformation of forms, unquote. The concept of technology at first seemed to define human acts in transcending the natural environment, since he said technology in its peculiar sense appears only with human beings. In one passage, he says that. But as he comes to recognize that not only human beings, but natural life in general makes forms, he extends its meaning and broadens the concept of form and technology accordingly to grasp not only human history, but natural history. That is, nature is technological in that it engenders forms. Mickey indeed clarifies that by nature, he means, uh, as we said earlier, biological life, uh, living or livid nature, ikeru shizen, the organism, yukitai, and refers to Kant, who conceived of an organic technology, organische technik, belonging to nature. Mickey states, quote, life is technological as that which makes forms. We can view not only man, but nature as technological to the extent that it makes forms. Human beings only continue what nature does, unquote. And he also says, the forms biological nature possess are made from the relations of adaptation between subject and environment, unquote, and stipulates that the behavior of any organism possessing a center 
and uh, this is from Helmut Plesner's term of center, uh, when there is a gap between themselves and their environment will be technological. He also states, quote, we can think of nature as also technological because everything that has life has forms. We can view the form of a living thing as born as the unity of the subjective and the objective due to being the living thing's adaptation to the environment. And to that extent, uh, we can see therein the technology of nature, unquote. What makes human technology distinct on the other hand is that it makes a cultural environment that is separate from the natural environment. Instead of simply adapting to the environment, it makes the environment compatible with itself in reverse adaptation. The ambiguity is whether the same sort of imagination is at work in nature. On the above basis, basis with the concept of transformation, Miki attempts to unify natural history and human history, recalling his earlier assertion that the technology of nature and the technology of human beings are both nothing but elements or stages of the self-formation of the historical world, and that everything actual possesses forms. Technology alters the forms of given things and given gives them new forms. Transformation is the fundamental operation of technology. Thus, as the forms of biological nature, like the forms of human artifice, change in relation to the environment, uh, and not simply passively, but actively with relative autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the environment, biological natural forms have the nature of transformation in common with human-made artificial forms. Miki likewise broadens the concept of production, saison. Uh, he says, uh, in cases where nature can be said to be technological, nature can also be conceived to be productive. Such productivity, even of biological nature, is intimately related to the imagination at the root of every technology and at the work, not only in the depths of the human soul, but also in the interiority of nature. We cannot deny, however, that the human-made forms of culture are quite distinct from natural forms and that they do not exist in nature just as they are. Human beings produce the various forms of culture through invention, that is, with new forms of behavior to facilitate adaptation to the environment. As stated above, Miki argues that the essence of technology is invention. But as invention is created, it requires imagination. At the same time, however, invention must be founded upon discovery. This uh, invention, he says, invention contains an element of discovery. Even though invention produces forms not existing in nature, it cannot produce forms contrary to nature. It must assimilate and compose existing elements to construct a new synthesis. In one sense, this forming in human culture is an imitation of nature, but also, as Miki states in Philosophy of Technology, a contemplation of nature. He says, technology takes up anew the construction of the universe at the point where it had been abandoned by nature, unquote. There is then both a continuity and discontinuity between humanity and nature in the transformation of forms. But the question remains where invention is in pure nature. This point is left vague by Miki, and perhaps if he had lived longer, he may have uh, clarified it. Human history is continuous with natural history to the extent that humanity at bottom is grounded in nature and human technology imitates nature. And yet it becomes discontinuous, discontinuous with nature as it develops culture. Quote, while life is defined by the environment, the autonomy of life is shown where it itself makes forms, even as it is being defined by the environment, unquote. While human beings shape culture by transcending nature as subjects, from another perspective, they are in fact only completing natural history within the broader historical world that subsumes them along with nature on the basis of transformation. Our technology participates in the transformation of the historical world. The real subject, more than human beings or the biological organism, then is this historical world, the shtik sikai. 
And both nature and man are participating in its self formation. Sounding like Nishida, he had already asserted in his philosophy of technology, quote, the historical world is creative and human beings are creative elements of the creative world. And another quote, human beings make things, uh, human be beings making things means that they are at work as means for the self-formation of the historical world. And as the formative element of the formative world, we participate in the self-formation of the historical world, unquote. And unfolding his own logic of imagination, Miki thus employs Nishida's logic with its concept of the historical world while explicating its development in terms of transformation. It is this idea that leads to his claim cited above that, quote, the creative logic of imagination is already at work within nature. To the extent that we can view natural life as technological and making forms, it follows the logic of imagination, unquote. He finds support for this extension of the imagination in Kant's characterization of genius as nature in the subject. In turn, Miki also takes this nature to be historical nature that unifies necessity and freedom. That is, he takes genius to be the productive capacity of a preconceptual or unconscious nature regulated by the imagination. Miki asserts that the logic of imagination is at the root of concrete nature seen in Kant's idea of the technology of nature, whereby not only human beings, but nature as historical nature are apparently broader than mere biological nature is genius at its root. Thereby, he places the logic of imagination even deeper than the human subjective faculties and ultimately at the root of the historical world that unifies humanity and nature. Thus, uh, seemingly letting go intentionally or not of his uh, self-proclaimed humanism of his earlier works. Despite his so-called humanism, Miki grasps human beings in relation to that which transcends or rather transcends uh, their being as the anontological unground, ungrund. So we get to the next section. And I should be finished in a couple of more pages. So. Next section is uh, the final section, critical assessment and conclusion. With the global expansion of human civilization, a discontinuous cleft appears to have arisen between humanity and nature, conspicuous in today's Anthropocene, due to our abusive attempt to forcefully assimilate nature and homogenize it into our uh, standing reserve, what Heidegger called the standing reserve. This has much to do with our technological reconstruction of our environment. As Akamatsu, a comment, commentator on Miki comments, whether Miki's account of technology is viable today or not would depend on whether it can resolve the fundamental issue of the Anthropocene and its destruction of nature. What appears to be Miki's anticipation of an ultimate harmony between human beings and nature via technology may be too optimistic a naivete traceable to his inheritance of the ancient Greek dualism of form and matter, which since Plato and Aristotle had been opposed to one another, itself modeled after the human production of things. The reduction of nature to matter as material for humanity's formative activity serves to intensify the Anthropocene, and if that is Mickey's intent, he neglects natural history per se. This precludes any genuine critique of problems that can arise from the technological imposition of forms of human civilization upon nature reduced to its mere material. Yet, if we take this anticipated harmony in the reverse direction by tracing it backwards to the assumed common ground of human beings in nature, the prospects may not be as one-sided. Mickey does, uh, Mickey does not simply ignore natural history when he says that nature itself possesses forms, gives birth to forms, and changes forms through history. Human technology as productive activity when producing new forms works to draw out the forms already latent within nature. 
form as Mickey conceives it, imminent to the historical world, is all, always changing in the history of the concrete world in which we partake. It is not the unchanging transcendental idols or idea of Greek metaphysics. Mickey underscores the realm of practice where new forms are made through our embodied interactivity with the environment. Forms as such are not transcendental, but can themselves be material and embodied in self-formation. Mickey thus affirmed the imagination instead of reason as the originary principle behind their production and conceived this production as concrete and imminent, involving the human praxis of being in the world rather than confining it to theodia. Be that as it may, uh, where are we left with then with the issue of the Anthropocene and its destructive alterations of the planet? And while it may be possible to say that, uh, quote, this creative power that can be thought to continue nature in the mind is the imagination, unquote, we have to question and clarify in what sense we can say that the imagination is working within nature as well and how to salvage on that basis of this common ground between humanity and nature, the planetary home we share with countless species from its destruction. To bring Miki's philosophy to life today and actualize the project he was unable to complete due to his untimely death, we will need to update it, such as by incorporating the more recent findings of ecology, information science, bio, technology, nanotechnology, cybernetics, computer science, and the new realities currently unfolding through the interface of the physical, the somatic, and the mental, and the virtual. In recent years, Bernard Stiegler, for example, has noticed the pressing issue of the technological, uh, technological particularly in artificial intelligence. And, and he also says, but more insidiously with the media in general. We will need to clarify the dialectics of continuity and discontinuity between nature and culture through an analysis of social somatic technological activity found not only in the physical world, but also in the virtual dimensions opening through computer technology and the internet. A viable appropriation of Mickey's logic of imagination then would mean not only furthering it beyond Kant, Nishida, and Heidegger, but also beyond Mickey himself in light of contemporary realities. And this requires our imagining and reimagining the imagination for the formation of a meaningful world. Thank you. <laughs>